Hi everyone, greetings again from Ganubi Baptist Church. Wonderful to be together again on a glorious winter's day here in the Eastern Cape. For those who don't know, my name is Mark Morell, and I'm here today to bring you a word of encouragement and hope and just welcome to each and every one of you. If you got your Bibles with you, won't you turn with me in God's Word to 1 Samuel chapter 3. Um, we finished up last week with our series in Revelation and what an encouraging series that was. And I hope our hearts were filled with hope. We know that the end of the story has already been written. We know that Jesus Christ is victorious. Jesus wins. And we know that our eternal future is absolutely secure in Him. But today I want to bring us back down to earth, so to speak. We can't be waiting with our bags packed at the rapture bus stop. <laughs> We've got lives to live now. And God has called us to be salt and light in this world, um, to shine as stars in a dark world. And so I really hope today is going to challenge us to be those agents of change, those ambassadors for Jesus that he's called us to be. So with that in mind, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. And it's a familiar story. Um, and I just trust that God's going to use it to really encourage us today. 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we'll pick it up in verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the law was rare, there were not many visions. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever, because of the sin he knew about. His sons uttered blasphemies against God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering. Samuel lay down until morning, and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it that he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. 
and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. And there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all of Israel. What a beautiful story. What powerful words. Well, friends, living here in the Eastern Cape, um, we are very familiar with drought. In fact, in certain parts of the Eastern Cape, uh, they are still experiencing really dramatic drought conditions at the moment. We know what it's like to have our dams running low, to be operating under water restrictions, and just the hardships that a lack of rain causes for our farmers and their livestock and their crops. Well, there's another kind of drought that's equally devastating, if not worse than a physical drought, and that is a spiritual drought. The kind of drought that Amos describes. Remember, Amos is an Old Testament prophet. Listen to what he writes in the book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And so when Samuel arrived on the scene, that was exactly the spiritual climate in Israel. Have a look at chapter 3 and verse 1 of our text we read just now. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli, and in those days the word of the Lord was rare. Interestingly, there was no shortage of religion at the time in Israel. The tabernacle, the place of worship in Shiloh, was a very busy place. People were coming and going and praying and singing and doing all the usual religious activities. But still, the word of the Lord was rare. And so really that begs the question in our lives, is the word of the, of the Lord rare in our lives? Is the word of the Lord rare in our context? Yes, we have the Word of God, the Bible, readily available. You may have many different versions and translations at home or on your phone or on your computer. But it's possible to have the Word of God at our fingertips and for it still to be rare in our lives. Rare in the sense that there's a disconnect between information and transformation. In other words, a disconnect between what we know and how we actually live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Someone once said to me, in fact, this was said to me this, this past Sunday by somebody after the evening service. They said, Pastor Mark, I've been through the Bible from cover to cover. Well, my question to them was, has the Bible been through you? <laughs> has the Word of God moved from information to transformation in your life? Or are you just another clever Christian sitting with a bunch of theological knowledge? Remember that parable Jesus told? Jesus says the wise man, unlike the foolish man, the wise man hears the word of God and applies the word of God. That's wisdom. Wisdom's not knowledge. Wisdom is applied knowledge. The wise man takes the knowledge he has, the blueprint of God's word, and the wise man applies that knowledge in every area of life. In other words, the Word of God becomes the firm foundation. The Word of God becomes the bedrock upon which he builds his life. And so this passage begins on a gloomy note, but it ends on a very, very positive note. Have a look at verse 21. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. And there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all of Israel. So I guess the question needs to be asked, what happened between verse 1 and verse 21? In 20 short verses, a lot of things changed. And that's what we're going to discover today. It's the story of God speaking to a young boy aged somewhere around 12 or 13, and then through that young boy, bringing spiritual renewal, spiritual awakening, revival to his nation. So let's begin in verse 2, where we see that Samuel has a personal encounter with the living God. 
Friends, how many of you know that you can never have a personal encounter with God and ever be the same again? That is absolutely impossible. In fact, one of the key pillars of our local church here in Ganubi is to introduce people to Jesus. We're trying to create opportunities for people of different generations and different backgrounds to encounter not religion, not denominational rules, but to encounter the living, risen Jesus. Have a look at verse 2. It came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. Now these verses are rich in symbolism. Firstly, do you see the contrast between old Eli and young Samuel? The contrast between old Eli and young Samuel. What do we know about Eli? Well, we know that Eli was an elderly man. The Bible tells us that. We know that he was out of condition physically. You can have a look at that in chapter 4 verse 18. And we also know that he was nearly blind. His eyesight was fading. So symbolically, Eli represents the spiritual state of Israel at that time, not a very healthy spiritual condition. In fact, under Eli's leadership, Israel was in a state of spiritual decline. Samuel, on the other hand, represents the power of God, bringing spiritual renewal, bringing spiritual awakening, bringing revival, new life, new hope to a nation. And boy, don't we need that spiritual awakening in our nation and in the world at this time. Now we know that God spoke to Samuel sometime during the course of the night. Because we told in verse 3 something very interesting. We told that the lamp of the tabernacle was still burning. You see, the lamp of the tabernacle was designed to burn throughout the course of the night until the morning. So more than likely, this encounter with God happened during the early hours of the morning, while the lamp of the tabernacle was still burning. Anyway, the scene is set for this encounter, and in verse 4, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel responds with, Here am I. In fact, each time Samuel heard the words, he responded in exactly the same way, Here am I. And friends, we see this response many times over in the Bible. When God called Abraham, way back in the Old Testament, Genesis 22 verse 1, when God called Abraham, Abraham's response was, Here am I. When God called Moses in that famous burning bush encounter, Moses' response was, Here am I. When God called Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, Whom shall I send? Whom shall I, and who will go for us? Asks the Lord. Isaiah responds, Here am I, Lord. Send me. What a wonderful response. Here am I. Lord, I'm living with an attitude of availability. Every morning you wake up, my friend, what a wonderful prayer to pray. Lord, it's a new day with new opportunities. Here I am. Use me. Send me. I'm available to be used by you. Well, we know from the text that initially Samuel didn't recognize the voice to be the voice of God. And that's why he kept going to Eli. And I guess the question again needs to be asked, why didn't Samuel recognize the voice to be the voice of God? Well, we don't have to speculate because verse 7 gives us the answer. It says in verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. It couldn't be clearer. The message translation says this all happened before Samuel knew God for himself. Critically important words. Maybe some of you watching today can identify with young Samuel. You believe in God. You... Um, 
are like Samuel, somewhat familiar with the church, maybe even attend church from time to time. You know something about God, maybe you've read something of the Bible, but you don't yet know God. There's a big difference between knowing about God and between knowing God. You haven't got a relationship with God. You haven't yet had an encounter with God. And the beauty is, the best part is, that can all change today. Old Eli recognized that something was happening in Shiloh that hadn't happened for many years. God was speaking. And so he tells Samuel, the next time you hear the voice, you answer with, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And friends, again, that should be our prayer every day. As we open the Bible, speak, Lord. As we come to church, speak, Lord. As we need direction to make certain decisions in life, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Well, verse 10. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak, for your servant is is listening. Two important observations. Number one, we see that God calls Samuel by name. Isn't that incredible? The God of this universe knows a young boy's name and when he calls him, he uses his name Samuel. Samuel. Friends, this is God's way. Isaiah 43 verse 1 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. What a verse. I've called you by name. You belong to me. Friends, today we live in a, in a world with a population somewhere around the 8 billion mark. 8 billion. Get your mind around that. But out of 8 billion people, God knows you. God loves you. God knows the very detail of your life. He knows your hopes, your dreams, your fears. He knows your future. And today, God calls you by name. God calls you by name. Well, this encounter we know radically changed Samuel's life. Samuel became a prophet and he went on to be used mightily by God in, in many ways that greatly impacted his nation's history. Which actually leads me to my second point, And that is this encounter with God led to an assignment from God. Isn't that beautiful? This encounter with God led to an assignment from God. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears <laughs> of everyone who hears it will tingle. What, a, what an amazing statement. I love that word tingle. Samuel, I'm going to do something in you and through you so unbelievable that people are hardly going to believe their ears. <laughs> what? Well, here it comes in verse 12, the assignment. At that time, I will carry out everything against Eli uh, that I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons uttered, uttered blasphemies against God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by offering or sacrifice. Friends, that is a hectic verse. And what a word for this young teenage boy to receive. What an assignment uh, for a young man to have to go to your boss, to have to go to your spiritual mentor and to tell him that you and your whole family are coming under the judgment of God and there is nothing that you can do to change it. You see, friends, Eli was the high priest of Israel at the time. And Eli's sons had spent years, if you do the research, blaspheming God and had utterly rejected the sacrificial system that in those days led to the forgiveness of sins. And dad, this spiritual leader, 
had done absolutely nothing to correct them. They were unrestrained. They were out of control. And so God is going to use young Samuel to share with Eli that time is up and the judgment of God is coming. You see, friends, sometimes we need to tell people not just what they want to hear, but we need to tell them what they need to hear. In these challenging days, we need to find the balance between grace and truth. Grace and truth. If it's all grace with no truth, you never address issues. You never help people to deal with sin. You never tell people what they need to hear. You never bring correction. And often that is rooted in the fear of man. What will people think? What will people say? And so we remain silent when in fact we should be speaking all grace with no truth. But on the other hand, if it's all truth with no grace, well, then we run the risk of becoming self-righteous, legalistic Pharisees. And I've been in conversations on many occasions where I've cringed because a person is being bombarded with the truth but with very little evidence of grace. It's truth, 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 with no grace. And so the person ends up winning the argument by losing the person's heart. Jesus, the Bible says, John 1, 14, Jesus came full of grace and truth. We need to find the balance between grace and truth. Well, the truth that Samuel needed to share with Eli was that there can be no forgiveness. There can be no atonement for sin if you reject, as his sons had done, the very means by which forgiveness is offered. And friends, exactly the same principle applies to us today. If you choose to reject the cross, if you choose to reject the sacrificial death of Jesus, Jesus who died in our place and for our sins, you're doing exactly what Eli's sons did and you're putting yourself in exactly the same danger. You see, the Christian message is a message of good news. But good news can only be good news if there's also bad news. <laughs> the good news has to follow the bad news. And the bad news is Romans 3 verse 23. For all, A-double-L, -L, all, everyone, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Friends, we know in our heart that verse is true. We won't debate it. We won't argue it. We know that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are guilty as, <laughs> you got it, S-I-N. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages, the result, the, the consequence of sin is death. Sin always leads to to death. So yes, that's the bad news. But here comes the good news. For God so loved the world. What kind of world? A world full of sinful, broken people, just like you and me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, anyone from any walk of life, from any background, who believes in Jesus should never perish but have everlasting life. That is the good news. It's a simple message delivered by simple messengers, but it's backed by the power of God. And that's why the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Simple message delivered by simple messengers backed by the power of God. Well, let's wrap it up with one final thought, and that is verse 19, where it says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. What an incredible verse. 
Dan was a town right in the very north of Israel and Beersheba was a town right in the south of Israel. So a whole entire nation from north to south was impacted by the life of this young man. Friends, can you imagine revival? Can you imagine spiritual awakening um, in South Africa that stretched from Polokwane in the north to Cape Town in the south? God, do it again. God, do it in our time. What was the secret to Samuel's success? Was it his dynamic personality? Was it his great charismatic gifting? Oh no. Verse 19 simply tells us that the Lord was with him. Nothing more, nothing less. It was God with this young man that made the difference. And friends, it's exactly the same with us. Our confidence as we face the future is not rooted in who we are. Our confidence is rooted on the one who lives on the inside of us. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives in our mortal bodies. And so in any given context, we are carriers of the resurrection power of God. And that is a game changer. And we close with verse 1 of chapter 4. And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. The spiritual drought was broken. The word of God was restored. Revival came to a nation through one man who was surrendered to God. Here I am, Lord. Friends, who will be the Samuels of this generation? Who will be the ones to live countercultural lives? Who will be the ones God will use to bring spiritual awakening and revival to our nation? Here I am, Lord. Let me leave you the quote as we close by D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody says, The world has yet to see what God can do with one man who is fully consecrated to him. Food for thought. May God bless you as you ponder those words. And we trust God for a great spiritual awakening, for revival in our day and in our nation. God bless. We'll see you next week.